Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. All right. Well, good morning. There are a lot of you out there. So good to have you all with us. First Sunday of the year. This is a great discipline to make showing up at church on Sunday a discipline this year. I would just encourage you, man, make it a priority. There, let me tell you this. The local church is the hope of the world because Jesus works through the local church. And if you're looking for, man, you're saying, I'm discouraged, I'm frustrated, I'm dealing with anxiety, there's no better place for you to come than on a Sunday morning. You're not going to get it from the TV. God bless all of the TV preachers that are out there that we're grateful for them. But being in community with others and rubbing shoulders with them, man, that is the way that we get stronger. And if you're feeling like people are rubbing your shoulders a little too much, we have a 10 o'clock service that still has space. We've started, this is our second week of doing a 9, a 10, and an 11. That 10 is a brand new service, and there's actually some space in there. We had somebody that said, they said, said after the service, he said, don't tell anybody about it. I like being able to breathe a little bit. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry. We had to add this service because God has been blessing us with so many people. If you haven't noticed, God is sending people. Pastor Marks and Natalie have been planting seeds faithfully here for a long time. And when you plant seeds and stick around long enough, you begin to sit in the, the shade and get the, get the benefit of those seeds you planted. And God is bringing people our way. Uh, people are moving here. We've got political refugees coming from California. Uh, we've got all sorts of people coming from all over the place. And people moving out from San Antonio to here. This is an interesting place to be. Who would have thought Seguin would be the place where it's at? But we're right in the middle of it. The church has been established for a long time. We aren't going anywhere. And this is a great place for you to build build in and be part of the church family here. So if you're here first time, welcome. I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here. And uh, we are starting our series today called Do It Again. And we sang just now about God's faithfulness. But what we're going to be talking about over this year is we know God is faithful. In fact, he says, I'll be faithful even if you aren't. But we're going to be talking about The fact that sometimes God's saying, I'm going to be faithful, but I need you to be faithful. And I need you to keep going even when it gets hard. And I need you to be persistent even when things are looking like they're not turning your way. I need you to stay in faith because I have seen so many times that many, many people, they give up just before the breakthrough comes. They always say it's darkest right before the dawn. How many, how many people, man, they just, you, you see they're just, they're so close that they can just hang on. They're about to get victory in their life. But then you go, ah, it, they're just, it's just not happening. And, and here's what I know for, uh, is true about all of you in this room, okay? Every one of you in this room, if we were to talk for a minute, there's something in your life where you're saying that you would say this, man, I'm trying, but it's not working. Some of you would say that with, your finances. You say, man, I'm just, I'm trying, but it's not working. I don't know about you guys, but Emily and me last year, it was a little bit of a tight year. Things were more expensive than we anticipated. And it was just stuff happened. We had to pay for it. And I was like, okay, this is going to be the year. I'm like, I was looking at our finances there. And I'm like, all right, I think we're back on track, Emily. I literally, this, this is no joke. I told her this Friday morning. I was like, man, I feel so relieved. I think our finances are back on track this year. And then I walked out my front door and I saw water gushing down the street. And I discovered we have somewhere in a thousand feet of water line, a water leak that I don't know where it is. And there was water everywhere. We had to shut off the water, flee our house for two days while the water level goes down to find where the leak is. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, this is going to cost a lot of money to do. And uh, I came in and, and I was talking to Emily and, and, and uh, the funny thing is this year, one of my, my goals for this year is I was like, all right, Lord, this is the year that nothing is going to shake me. <laughs> Whatever happens, I'm not going to be shaken by it. And then the Lord gave me a wonderful opportunity, right? <laughs> you ever had that in your life where you pray for something and the Lord gives you an opportunity to exercise that? And you're like, well, I didn't want to learn it that way. Like, never ask the Lord for patience because he'll give you opportunities to be patient, right? That's what happened with me. I was like, our finances are on track. And then, bam. I'm like, I'm trying here, Lord, to be faithful. We've, you know, we're being really careful with our finances, and then this happens. And some of it's it's our finances, some of it's our our relationship. You're looking at your marriage, and you're going, man, I am trying and trying and trying, but it's not getting better. I'm trying. We've tried everything. We've tried marriage counseling. It's not getting better. Some of you with your relationship with your kids, you're saying, I'm trying. It's not getting better. Some of you in your business, you're like, man, I'm trying to do it, trying to do it, and it's not. Things aren't improving. And listen, sometimes God asks us to just say, hey, 
I'm going to let this go. I'm going to leave this behind. I'm going to move on. I'm going to let it go, right? Some of us, our problem is we hold on too tight. But I think a lot of us, our problem is we hold on to our plan too tight. And God's saying, what you're doing is kind of the right idea, but I need you to do it a little bit of a different way. And I need you to do it again. I will need you to come from a different angle. It's the same thing, different angle. And that's what changes everything. So I have, uh, I have four guys in my life that I call pretty much at the beginning of every year. And they're mentors, they're friends. And I say, hey, guys, here's what I feel like I'm supposed to be doing this year. Does this resonate with you? And let me tell you, men, if you're in this room right now and you don't have a group of guys that you can go to, there was a study done the other day that, that said one, only one in 10 men say they have somebody they can go to and share the struggles they're facing. There are a lot of lonely men in America right now. There's this harsh proverb it says this, Proverbs, it, 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 in Proverbs, it, uh, King Solomon, he says this. He says, he who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against sound judgment. Men, if you don't have somebody you can go and share things with too, you are like the gazelle on the prairie. You know who the lion goes after on the prairie, the cheetah goes after? The one who's separated from a herd. And I know, men, we've got this thing in us. We're like, I can figure this out on my own. I'm a man. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Listen, if you're out there trying to do this thing on your own, you're going to get pummeled. You're going to get chewed to pieces. You need to find somebody to get in connection with, somebody that's, that's going to challenge you and push you. That's a lot of times. We don't, want to, we don't want people to push us. We want things the way we are, but you're not going to get better until somebody pushes you to be better. And that's what these guys do for me. So I was talking to one of these mentors, and I said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been doing this. I've been doing outdoor adventures. I've been writing. I've been speaking. I've been serving at this church. And after I shared all this with him, he goes, well, here's what it sounds like you need to be working on. It sounds like you need to be doing outdoor adventures, and you need to be writing, and you need to be speaking, and you need to be continuing to work at the church. And I was like, well, that's what I've been doing. And he said, yeah, well, you need to do it again. I said, well, I've been working. I'm like, I'm not seeing quite the results I wanted to see. And he said, yeah, but you're, he basically said, you're just getting started. And he says, you just need to stay faithful and do it again. And there's this story that I love. It's the first time Jesus ever meets Peter. There's a story in the Bible where it says this. It says, on one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that's Galilee, they have another name for it, Gennesaret. It said, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. So he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon. Simon is Peter. This is their first time they meet, Okay. And he asked him to put out a little further from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So Jesus is preaching. All these people are sitting on the shore. He's preaching. They didn't have microphones back then, so he had to project his voice over the water. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, he said, Peter, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, uh, we've been working hard all night and haven't caught anything. Now, what's interesting, Peter is a professional fisherman. His livelihood depends on this. He knows how fish work. Now, I am not a good fisherman. Every time I've ever gone fishing, it's very boring and I never catch anything. But a few months ago, Pastor Marcus and I and Jeremiah, our worship pastor, we went down to the coast with a guy named Jeff Stavanoff from our church here. And Jeff has this weird thing about fish. It's about 1030 at night. We're sitting there. I'm ready to go to bed. And Jeff goes, the fish are biting. <laughs> he could smell it. I'm like, that's baloney. There's no way he can smell it. He's like, nope, they're biting. I'm going out. I'm like, I'm going to bed. I know how fishing goes for Joel. <laughs> fish don't bite. So he and Pastor Marcus and J Jeremiah, they head out and they go out to the dock and I'm going to bed. And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm thinking, that was a weird thing they did. I'm like, you know, I'm going to go see what's up over there. So I put my clothes back on, ran back out there, and these guys are pulling in fish. I mean, it hits the water, and they're pulling a fish in. I'm like, what? I'm thinking, yeah, that works for them. As soon as I start playing the game, the fish are going to be like, oh, it's Joel. You know, <laughs> swim around my lure, right? <laughs> Jeff's like, here, let me set you up, man. He sets it up. I throw it in. Bam, I catch a fish. I'm pulling in fish like one a minute because Jeff knew fish, and he knew right when they were biting. Now, it's so interesting because Peter... He knows fish. This is what the dude does for a living. But Jesus comes along, and he's like, Peter, I need you to go fishing again. And he says, uh, yeah, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. I kind of know how fish work. That's what I do for a living. But because you say so, 
I'll let down the nets. Basically, Peter's like, not a whole lot of faith even. He's like, yeah, whatever. All right, let's try it again. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Now, what I think is fascinating is Peter had been doing this. He had been working hard, and he hadn't gotten the results he was looking for. But then Jesus spoke, and it changed everything. And all it took was Peter's obedience to do it one more time, and their nets were completely full. He, God, Jesus did what Peter couldn't have done all night. And some of you, man, you've been, you've been feeling like you're in a night right now where you're just like, it's not working. Let me tell you this. God can change anything in an instant. With one touch of his favor, with one word spoken, it can be the time. There's this guy named Malcolm Gladwell, and he wrote a book called Outliers, where he looked at people who were the best in their fields. He looked at people in music, in sports, and what he found was there was a researcher named Anders Ericsson, and Anders Ericsson had been studying high-performing individuals. And what they found is the people that get to the top of their field in any given field, they have one consistent common denominator. They have all spent 10 thousand plus hours in disciplined, focused, intentional practice on their skill. 10,000 hours. That's a lot of hours, y'all. That's a lot of days. That's a lot of weeks. That's a lot of months. That's a lot of years. And he found the common denominator between people who rose to the top where they had stayed focused on one thing, doing it over and over again, getting better and better at it for 10,000 hours. And then they hit overnight success. There's a comedian right now named Nate Bargetzi. Uh, I recommend him because he's super clean. He's super funny, but he came out of nowhere. I had never heard of him. And then all of a sudden he's got a Netflix special, an Amazon special, and then he's hosting Saturday Night Live. I mean, the guy came out of nowhere. And I'm like, who is this guy? Well, I saw Dave Ramsey interview him the other day. And Dave said, Nate, how did you know when you'd arrived? And he said, well, it was kind of a weird thing. He said, because here's what happens in comedy. In comedy, if you stay at it long enough, doing nightclubs every night, do, making jokes, bombing on jokes, talking to crowds that end up throwing you out because they think you're not very funny, he says, it usually hits at 10 years or at 20 years that you become an overnight success. And he said, I just got lucky and got it at 10. I'm like, 10 years. Can you imagine 10 years how many times he spoke to a crowd that had just flopped and they're like, you're not funny, get off the stage. Can you imagine? I can. I get that all the time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I really can do that because there's sometimes where I get up and speak and I, I'm like, I feel like I'm supposed to say something, but then like I, I don't say it the way I want to say it. And the beautiful thing about God's grace is God will often speak through me even when I'm not like meaning to. I'll have people come up to me. I had a guy one time come up to me. He's like, man, when you talked about the importance of forgiving your dad, that really hit deep. And I was like, I didn't talk about the importance of forgiving your dad today. But that's what the Holy Spirit interpreted to him. Right. And that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. He will often speak through my bumbling. But, you know, the more I do this, the more I feel like I'm getting worse at it. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm not, I, I tell him, I was like, I was so good when I first got started. But that's because I didn't know anything. You ever notice how you get better at something? You're like, I'm really not that good at this. But when your ig ignorance is bliss, you're like, I'm so great. <laughs> I just can't imagine how, you know, an overnight success in 10 years. And I think that's what happens for a lot of us is we get focused. We want like things to happen really fast, but there's a lot of training that has to happen. So Malcolm Gladwell in his book, he concludes this. He says, here's the formula for achievement. It's talent plus preparation. Talent is one thing, right? I have this friend. He's the greatest musician I know. The guy is incredible. But he's so ridiculously talented that he slides along and he's lazy because he can do in his, like, no effort what, it, what most musicians can't do ever. He's that good. And so he gets lazy. And a lot of times I've seen people with great talent that because they get lazy, they don't either keep discipline or they don't keep discipline on their own abilities. There was a football player a few years ago from my town of Kerrville. Big deal. He was the be next big, big thing, remember? Got drafted into the NFL and destroyed his life because he didn't have the discipline to maintain where the talent took him. 
And so many times in life, we've got talent, but if you don't, if you just depend on that talent and you don't continue to discipline yourself and get better and better and better, you may not get to the top. One of my favorite quotes is a guy named Francois de la Rousseau. It's really encouraging for me. He says this. He says, the art of using moderate ability to advantage often brings greater results than actual brilliance. That's encouraging because I'm moderate at most things I do. But if you continue working at your moderate ability, it will get better and better and better if you stay disciplined and focused and you just keep doing it again. Talent alone won't get you there. You have to have talent and preparation, but I'm convinced there's another formula. Malcolm Gladwell says this is the formula, but I think the, th the third missing piece in this is God's blessing. Because I've seen people that have been slaving away for a long time and something, and maybe they're, they've got some talent, they're not the best, but then God takes them and pop, launches them to the top. And you go, how did they get there? They're not even that good. It was God's blessing on them. It was the art of using moderate ability to advantage. And then God says, hey, I like how you're doing that. You're not the best, but I'm going to take you to the top places you could never get on your own. And how many people, I see musicians all the time looking up here like, how did that guy arrive at the top? It was God's blessing. He's not, yeah, you're a better musician than him probably. But somehow God saw something in him and blessed them. And I believe the same is true in your life. But listen, it's going to take a lot longer than you think. We think we're so short-term minded, right? We, we think we, we overestimate what we can do in a month, a year, and we underestimate what can be accomplished with discipline and focus, doing it again and again over five, 10 years. And if you want to be a success, you've got to start thinking not in terms of days or weeks or months, but in terms of years and decades. There's this thing Jesus said. He said this. He said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. So he's out there doing his thing. He's planting seeds. It says he sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, but he doesn't know how. It just happens. When you plant the seed, it grows. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. He's saying there's a process, and that process, every part of the process is necessary. If it pops up overnight, it's not going to have the strength it needs to sustain it. Some of you have been working really hard at something, really hard trying to develop your skill in this. You're going, man, it's not getting anywhere. Well, listen to me. If you're intentionally focused on doing this for the glory of God and making sure you're getting better so you can use it to honor him, it is doing something. You just may not see it because it's such a slow growth. Slowly, slowly, as you plant the seed, you're going to see a harvest. But you got to stay at it because every challenge that you're facing, it's growing you stronger and stronger. And you're going to need that strength. When, ch when you get higher and rise higher, you're going to need that strength but it requires discipline every day. You're, str you're struggling to beat an addiction. I talked to somebody this morning. She said, man, I'm trying to beat this addiction. And she's just fighting it and fighting it. And the craving is there every morning. When things go bad, she wants to go back to it. She's like, nope, this is the year it's changing. And one of the things I, I, I learned from a friend of mine that runs a huge addiction, addiction center in LA, he said this. He said, the way you do addiction is you focus on one hour at a time and then one day at a time. You go, man, I stayed clean for this hour. And then the next hour, I stayed clean. And by the time the end of the day comes, you go, I stayed clean for a whole day. And you stay focused on that. And then you get up the next morning, put your shoulders back, and you do it again. And you celebrate the victory. I'm a day clean. And then you go another hour by hour by hour. And then you go to bed, and you get up again. You go, I'm two days clean. And little by little, as you take small steps, you look back and you go, man, every morning I got up, I did what was right. I trusted God's power because it's his power that's at work in me to give you the power to do it. When you get disciplined, he will activate the power you need to accomplish what he wants you to do. But you can't give up too early. And I see so many people that right before the breakthrough, they give up. I see people that they, they're finally getting a breakthrough spiritually at church, but somebody's starting to poke around in their business, and they leave. And I go, well, why'd you leave the church? And they say, well, they started judging me. I'm like, were they judging you, or did they see some greatness in you you couldn't even see in yourself because you've been so beat down by lies? And they're saying, you're better than this, man. You're better than this. And you're like, well, you're judging me. No, they're not judging you. They're calling greatness out of you that you can't even see in yourself. And if you bail, jump ship too early, you're not going to become all you could be. You got to stay in the fight and you got to trust God's putting people in your life that are speaking into you. And yeah, they're pushing you and yeah, it's uncomfortable. But over time, as you surrender to that and say, God, I want to get better, God is going to bring those people in your life. And as you change little by little and do the right thing every day, you are going to see a harvest. I love this in Galatians. It says this. It says, let's not become weary in doing good. Don't let yourself get tired out. 
for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. That means you get up every morning, you go, God, I need your strength today to, to do this. And you get up and you do your best and trust his power. And when you think you can't do it anymore, man, maybe, maybe the key is just to, look, sometimes you, you've got to just stop going at the fast pace you're going. It doesn't matter how fast you go as long as you keep going. Maybe you just need to slow down and go, all right, I'm just going to focus on the next step here. I can't, I can't even focus on tomorrow or the next day or next day. I'm going to focus on winning today and I'm going to believe God's given me the strength. Jesus said that. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough problems of itself. Worry about today and stay focused on making the change. Whatever it is you're trying to do this year, guys, get your health in order, lose weight, beat something. Maybe you've been told you've got cancer and you're like, I'm going to heal this thing naturally. Listen, stay faithful at it. Don't give up. Be wise. Listen to wise counsel. Maybe you're trying to improve your business. Seek counsel. Maybe you're trying to improve your marriage. Seek counsel by all means. Listen, and, and this is the important thing. People come to me and they're like, man, I've been trying to get our marriage on track for six months. And I'm saying, listen, that's a ridiculous time frame. It took you 15 years to mess the thing up. It's going to take a while to get it back on track. So don't lose heart. Start thinking in terms of years and decades, not weeks and months. You go, well, that's hard. It is hard. But anything of value is hard. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But God wants to give you the power to do what's really hard. And on the other side, you're going to go, wow, this is amazing how good it has been. It's exceedingly, abundantly, far above all I could ever ask or think according to his power that's at work in me. You guys receive that? Yeah. Let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you so much that you give us the power in this life to do what we can't do on our own. So I pray for those this, this morning. They're, they're, they're looking ahead and they're going, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this year. Lord, I pray that this morning you would just rise up within them, Lord, a sense of confidence in your power that's at work. And they would say, I'm going to get disciplined. I'm going to get focused. I'm going to get up tomorrow. I'm going to do it again. And then the next day, I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to do it again. And as we look back over this year, Lord, we're going to see miraculous things that you've done incrementally, slowly, as we've stayed focused and disciplined and intentional about doing the right thing and what we're supposed to do. If you're here this morning and you do not have your relationship right with Jesus, that is literally the first step to getting the power of Christ working for you. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. You already know who you are if you've been feeling it in your heart that you need this. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer, God is going to come. He's going to forgive your sins, everything you've ever done. He's going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness, put you up, set you up with an eternal address with him in eternity. It starts by saying this prayer. It's not a magic formula, but it's a prayer of sincerity in your heart. Let's all say this together with me. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Man. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources for you at the back at guest services. Don't leave without checking in with us. Now, two quick things. We uh, here at the church, uh, the staff and the elders have all gotten together. And we've written a little 21-day challenge, a do-it-again challenge, where Pastor Marcus, he went through the Bible and he picked out a bunch of guys that God, for them to get their breakthrough, for God to do something in their life, they had to do something over and over and over again. And he picked out some really cool stories, and we all wrote devotionals around them. They're really short devotionals. It won't take you very long. But the way you can access that, first of all, if you're already on the email list from the church, you already got an email about it. But the way you can access it is if you go to the, you can scan the QR code on the back of your chair there. You'll go to the app, and there you'll see that little red button down there. It says, you're destined for more. And that next button, that button, it says next step. You push that, and then you sign up on that red button there that says the 21-day challenge. I want to encourage you to do that. And then there's one other thing. I felt like I was supposed to, in January do a small five-minute video devotional on the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, if you've ever read Ecclesiastes, you go, this is a weird book. It seems very cynical. It seems very negative. I actually think Ecclesiastes is the most hope-filled book in the entire Bible. It's my favorite book of the Bible. So I'm doing a short five-minute devotional. I'm on TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, all those places. Yes, I got on TikTok, the devil's lair. It's, it's like TikTok is the worst. But hopefully I can shine a little dark, a light in the darkness there. Uh, but you can find me on any of those platforms. Or if you want, you can scan this. And every Monday, I send out a super short, encouraging email. I'll give you a link in the email. You'll get it from me tomorrow. You can sign up uh, by scanning this QR code. It'll send you a link. Put your email in, and you'll be signed up. I want to encourage you to do both of those things. Start your year off right. Do the 21-day challenge, and then watch the short video. And I believe that, man, it's going to be a good year, y'all. It is really. We're going to face some stuff we never saw coming, but it's going to be a good year. All right, let's stand. Lord, I pray, pray, Lord, your blessing on them. I pray, Lord, to bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you. You guys put your shoulders back. Walk with confidence. God is for you. You guys have a great week. Be blessed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, 
come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>